in our in our service this morning in Sydney, we talk about uh, understanding uh, what it means now that the Antichrist is born in 2015. So if you want to uh, hear the message, which is already uploaded, and uh, people need to understand that uh, there are three restraining forces against the uh, evil and the Antichrist on the planet Earth. And that is, one is God himself, two is the people of God, three is the need for a human vessel for anything good or evil to come true, which is why Jesus has to also come as a man in the Adamic race to exercise all authority on the planet Earth and take over everything uh, as a member of the Adamic race, thus saving the Adamic race. When Antichrist was born, one of the restraining forces was removed. Satan now actually has someone in human form uh, in an Adamic race. So it's just like, you know, he can do anything he wants, except two more restraining forces are there, and that is the people of God, which is the glorious church, and Almighty God. So we explained about this concept in the earlier service uh, in Sydney. Now we are broadcasting to you live, and hi to you all those in Singapore gathered together and are waiting to move into the uh, next place. Remember again, I proclaim this year is a year of increase. And to those who believe, as they hold fast to the word of God, you will increase in every way. And all the works of God will increase, double, triple, and your, your blessings of God, the spirit, soul, and body, double, triple. This is a year of increase for those who accept it, and for those who reject it, of course, you know, that it's up to them. It is important for us to move forward and continue to uh, grow in the things of God. Remember, the enemy has nothing to offer. He know only how to go against, but they got no material. It's just like, you know, don't eat McDonald's, but they got no burgers to offer you. Don't eat Kentucky Fried Chicken, but they got no fried chicken to offer you. Uh, don't go to that restaurant, but they themselves got nothing to offer you. The only thing they offer is traditional Christianity. They don't believe in the end times, and they are not prepared for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the messages and doctrines that are necessary in order to grow to be part of the glorious church. Which is all the reason for this move. And we are in the end time. The last seven times seven years. And it is essential that we know what to do with each passing year. That we know how to go forward in each passing year. How to tap upon the glory of the Lord available. And remember the seven times glory, Pergamos glory. To learn how to tap upon it and move into it until we become exactly like our Lord Jesus. Walk with Him, talk like Him, and demonstrate all the love and the glory and power of our Lord Jesus Christ. In this series on Sunday, we have been preaching about resurrection power. So today, I want to take it uh, in that direction too for this message in Singapore about resurrection power. And today, I want to talk about um, the supply of the Holy Spirit. See, one of the mysteries about uh, working the power of God, uh, remember that Satan will try to work his lying signs and wonders, you know. And today's attack is uh, uh, Satan trying to go high, rise higher and higher. When, you, when people begin to attack character assassination, that's one thing. Then when they begin to call the work of God, an evil work, when you call the work of the Holy Spirit evil work, when, when, when you have true visions and people claim false vision, and then you have true apostles, like Paul, he wrestled against false apostles, and then you realize it is a different level of attack. And that is why we need to rise up and understand. Firstly, no man can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit, and we could proclaim Jesus is Lord. And the enemy and the devil and any false prophet, false apostle cannot preach Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And we proclaim Jesus as the only true way to salvation and only through being born again and by the blood of the Lamb, which the enemy don't dare to even mention the blood of the Lamb. Have you found any demon calling upon the blood of the Lamb? Have you found any false prophet or false, false apostle or the Antichrist himself? Does he dare to mention the blood of the Lamb has saved all of us? Glory to the Lamb of God. So, and so you realize that... Uh, uh, the enemy is really foolish in all that they are doing. And one of the things that the Lord showed was uh, in an all-night prayer in a vision, uh, in encountering the Lord. I said, Lord, 
we really been through a tight, tough persecution time. And the Lord says, uh, he gave assurance and the Lord said that uh, he's permitted all things like he permitted Pharaoh to go against Moses. And then the Lord reminded, Moses was not prepared and he was at first discouraged. Remember, Moses was surprised at the resistance that he encountered when Pharaoh did not let the people go. So he even came back because even the people were discouraged. The people said, oh, Pharaoh make us work twice as hard. Before he provides straw, now we got to get the straw and our quota must still be the same. And uh, so they blame Moses. They say, hey, Moses, you make our life harder, much, much harder. And then Moses came back to God and said, God, why is all this happening? Why are the people not let go? And the God said, wait, you know, be patient. And the Lord says, he's going to show his power. In the book of Romans, we are told, and these people had no more fear for God. I mean, the fact that you dare to call the Holy Spirit's work evil spirit, the fact that you dare to call the visions of God and all these end time visions, false visions or from the enemy, that has no more fear of God. And when Pharaoh and his minions and the false musicians began to challenge Moses and God, God said in the book of Romans, from I'll read that one. From this time forward, I will use you to demonstrate my judgment and my power. So, just like the Bible people resist the Holy Spirit, I would say people who go to this level have reached a point where they are resisting the Holy Spirit. Yes, when you go against the Holy Spirit, you are standing on the opposite side and resisting the Holy Spirit. And uh, in the book of uh, Romans, Paul says this of, um, right, scrolling is not as fast, so let's jump to it. In the book of Romans chapter 9, it tells us here of uh, verse 17. For the scripture says to the Pharaoh, For this very purpose I raise you up that I might show my power in you, that my name may be declared on all the earth. He has mercy on whom he wills, whom he wills he hardens. So the Lord Jesus in the vision told me that those who rise to this level have no more fear of God in their life. The next act will be God acting. Once we move into the new place, I already pray and say, Lord, what shall we do? We will proclaim a three-day fast. And then we will gather in the place every evening. And the three-day fast will be that which we're going to release all that needed to be released. And I talk about 21-day fast. The Lord says three days is sufficient. And in the new place, we're dedicated to the Lord. Just before the dedication service, we have a three-day fast. And the Lord is not pleased and the lord is going to handle all this it's not for us for us we just say lord it's all in your hands now about the resurrection power of the lord jesus christ and uh, i was also talking to the lord uh, on this i said lord how nice how wonderful we have already seen some miracles we have seen you know uh, your works here and there and the operation of the gifts of the spirit how nice it is that we just go out and, uh, and bring creative miracles or heal several blind people and all those things. And uh, then we need to know how all these things take place. And we talk about the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in the book of Galatians, Paul, although he was, he was writing to the Galatians who was at a point of being tempted to fall down or tempted to deny the gospel of Jesus Christ to go back to Judaism and the law, Paul was writing them to encourage them, to remind them how God worked in their midst. And although he asked rhetorical questions, the answer is pretty obvious. In uh, Galatians chapter 3, he says in uh, verse 2 on words, Galatians 3 verse 2, This only I want to learn from you, he says. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain? Even if it was in vain. In verse 2, it says that we receive the Spirit 
not by the works of the law, but by the hearing of faith. So it's important when you minister baptism in the Spirit or people who to be born again, uh, though they're born of the Spirit, it's important to preach the gospel, preach the word, and as they believe the word, they act on the word that is proclaimed belief, they get a miracle of the new birth, or they get the baptism in the Spirit through the hearing of faith. That one, we all understand the principles and the methodology of releasing that portion of God's power. But here's an interesting thing. Read on. Verse 5. Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Implying by the hearing of faith, correct? So, we know that Hearing of faith is important to release a miracle. That's why Jesus always tells us, go and preach the gospel to every creature in Mark chapter 16, verse 17 and 18. And these signs will follow you. In my name they shall cast out demons, they shall speak in new tongues, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And he said they went out preaching and these signs followed them. So uh, definitely, the signs and wonders are going to follow the preaching of the gospel. And the hearing of faith is important. But if you look carefully at this verse 5, it indicates that miracles needed something else called the supply of the Spirit. So there are two things here. Besides the hearing of faith, there is the supply of the Spirit. The word supply comes from the Greek word epi. Epikoregio. 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 Epikoregio uh, means to furnish, to fully supply, to minister, to nourish, and uh, uh, to be assisted in the supply of different things. And so, epikoregio, uh, in the Greek form, when you look at the original Greek, uh, here I'm looking at the analytical. Uh, Greek lexicon, it talks about uh, uh, furnish, uh, provide, and then uh, in one section here, it talks about um, uh, to anoint, to smear, or to rub upon. It's like the anointing coming uh, in a contact, contactful form, an uh, epicorrigio. Also, it is metaphorically and figuratively used of the supply of spiritual benefits, but uh, in one of the word, uh, one of the outlines of it being used in the Greek, it says, "of vigo, vigo." That means energy supplied to the body, to the body, uh, to be supported. And here it's implied Colossians two nineteen, in which uh, not holding fast to the head from whom all the body nourish knit together by joints and ligaments, grows in the increase that is from God. So there is some sort of energy supply to create the miracles. And that's something we need to learn how to flow with. And uh, let me talk about this matter of energy level for miracles. See, the higher the miracles, the greater the miracles, where you know, you can see vision, but having it real is something. You can sing the song, you know, uh, the lame walk, the blind see. It's being sung in every church. But there are blind people in the midst. Why aren't they healed? Because legally, doctrinally, you may believe that Jesus took all sicknesses and disease. But right in front of you is a blind man, a lame man, a sick person, someone dying of a sickness. There is a legal reality, spiritual reality, then there's a physical reality. How to have it in a physical reality? There is, besides the hearing of faith in Galatians chapter 3, verse 5, there is a supply or energizing of the spirit. And that energizing is a, I would call that the spiritual energy transmutated into the physical dimension, and that ties with the resurrection power. Uh, the closest demonstration I can have that is in 2 Kings chapter 13, when Elisha was already dead. And it tells us that his body has decayed to the point where the flesh is gone, only the bones are left. 
and it happened to be possibly uh, near a well or for some reason maybe over the years the burial site uh, was near a well and uh, then uh, and his bones were exposed that's what second Kings chapter 13 says and then it so happened that there was a man who is dead and they were looking to bury him so the well must be near the cemetery site also and uh, then as the the people carry the dead man a band of raiders came and out of fear and fright they threw the dead man temporarily into the well and when the dead man contacted elisha's bone the dead man was resurrected there was no hearing of faith neither were the two fellows who carried the dead man exercising faith for him to be resurrected from the dead nobody was exercising faith it was in that particular case pure energy but somehow the energy of the holy spirit was still retained in elisha's bones and there was enough energy spiritual energy of the holy spirit of course that was in his bones to raise one more person from the dead that is the supply of the spirit of god so for a miracle sign and wonder to take place you need two things the hearing of faith is still important the preaching of the gospel like paul preaching in the book of acts chapter 14 to the man and at least men at lystra heard the word and faith came and then he brought forth uh, the healing for the man who was lame from his mother's womb but there is what i call the supply of the spirit let's call it the quantity of the spirit since quality is not an issue i mean how dare anyone question the quality of the holy spirit that will be the supreme highest most quality but the quantity of the energizing of the spirit so the only reason why creative miracles why the blind are not healed right in front of you or why the most powerful miracles that jesus did is not manifest is the quantity of the spirit now does there or is there such a thing doctrinally and theologically called the quantity of the supply of the spirit check the bible and the answer is yes firstly in the life of elijah and elisha what was the transaction between the two men of god the transaction was that elisha asked for double portion of the holy spirit doesn't that speak a quantity he wants double the quantity that was in elijah's life and any bible scholar who would examine it and different bible scholars depending on what they count some count eight miracles recorded in elijah's life although of course there are more than eight but eight were recorded and 16 recorded in elisha's life just you know the bible is very strict on trying to show the the exactness of his fulfillment prophetically so the 16 and number 16 was the raising of the dead man uh, from the date when he touched elijah's bone some other scholars count more than eight in elijah and then they also count double on the other side they count more things but uh, it depends what is counted but there are various ways you could show that there was an exact doubling of the miracles whichever count you use and it has nothing to do with the quality of the anointing it has to do with the quantity of the anointing and elisha was quite skillful to learn how to tap on this energizing supply that he had upon him that was why in one of the early miracles that he did there was a miracle that was the raising of uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the boys from the dead and you notice a very strange phenomena here in the book of uh, second kings if you have your bible look at the second kings and um, 
First, the boy was a gift from God uh, to the uh, Shunammite uh, woman. Uh, and then one day the boy died. The boy died. He grew and he died. So the mother was very distressed, rode the donkey all the way to see Elisha. And um, then when Elisha found out that the boy was uh, dead, uh, he sent his servant ahead first and then uh, not, no results. And uh, then in verse 32, when Elisha himself in 2 Kings chapter 4 verse 32 came into the house, there was the child lying dead on his bed. Now I want you to look at the strange thing he did. He went in therefore, shut the door behind the two of them, prayed to the Lord. And he went up and lay on the child, put his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, his hands on his hands, and he stretched himself up on the child, and the flesh of the child became warm. Why did he do that? Because he understood that one of the performance of miracles is the energizing of the Holy Spirit supply. Since he has received the double portion, he knows the energy for miracles is there. And he wanted to make sure he transmit all the energy in his life into this child. Mouth to mouth, eye to eye, hand to hand. And as he did that, the energy that was in his life, of course, uh, there's no way you could touch the bone because there are muscles and sinews and skin that cover the bone. But he was transmitting the energy of the spirit. And a boy was raised from the dead. Interesting. Pure energy that is flowing. Now, you'll remember also there was uh, uh, in the Bible, in the Gospel of John, it talked about, I need to prove all these things from the Bible. And uh, that uh, in the Gospel of John, that uh, there was a very strange phenomena that uh, uh, as they wait at the pool of Siloam, that uh, there was a side effect thing that uh, once in a while, the water stir in John chapter 5. The water stirred in verse 4. John 5 verse 4. An angel went down at a certain time into the pool, stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well or whatever disease he had. Only the first guy. Only the first guy. Uh, uh, only the first guy. Did we turn on the power? Thank you. And only the first guy was healed. The second guy was not healed. Only the first guy. Why? Did the others, number two, also believe? Number two also believe what? That's why he jumped in. Number three also believe. Now, there was a whole group of what I call, you will call that a, a handicapped race into the pool once the water stir. And uh, uh, can, I can imagine uh, once in a while it was not the angel stir, uh, now some wind stir, or somebody accidentally throw something in and it stir. Everybody jumping, uh, because uh, they cannot be waiting one minute and the next minute because number two never got healed, number one get healed. So the first to jump in, of course, all is ready to jump into the water. And uh, so if it was not the angel, if something stirred the water, they all jump in. Everybody got wet, nobody got healed. But if it was the angel stirring it. There was leftover latent energy. And that latent energy could heal. And whoever jumped in first got healing. Quite a funny story. Why was it put there in the Bible? So that we can teach what we call the energizing or the supply of the Holy Spirit. That is what I call a quantity of the energizing of the Holy Spirit. And of course, uh, Jesus is a phenomenal in that uh, it is said of our Lord Jesus Christ that uh, by John himself, when uh, John was questioned about our Lord Jesus Christ, and um, uh, John himself acknowledged that for Jesus, he was different because he had the Spirit without measure. In John chapter 3, it says in um, verse uh, 34, in reference to Jesus Christ, For he whom God has sent speak the words of God, 
For God does not give the Spirit by measure, especially to Jesus Christ. Now, does God give the Spirit by measure? There is such a thing as a measure of the Holy Spirit. Do you know that when you and I were born again, we received a measure called the born again measure? That the Bible calls the earnest of the Spirit? And uh, that is the, like a first measure. Uh, let's uh, look at the book of Ephesians just to prove the point that that reference uh, without uh, measure. Ah, I forgot this is not uh, King James, so uh, it would be like a, a deposit. Yeah. Um, okay, King James uses the word earnest. Uh, so let's just look at the book of Ephesians. It changed the language it used. Ephesians chapter 1. There you go. We have received the first portion or first part of the inheritance by which God has sealed His promise. There in verse 11, In Him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things. And then he says in verse 13, In Him, chapter 1, Ephesians, you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the guarantee. You know what the word guarantee here is the pledge portion. That means the pledge portion that you are born again, your sons of God, God gave you the portion called the born again measure. So there is measure of the Holy Spirit. And that is why it is possible for a person to be born again but not baptized in the Spirit. Because baptized in the Spirit is to be filled with the Holy Spirit to overflow it. That's another measure. Then there are many measures that continue. Many measures of energizing. Elisha himself received double portion. Jesus himself got measureless because Jesus was Jesus. He was perfect in every way. The question we ask is, what do you think is your measure? One volt, two volts, one megavolt, uh, one millivolt, or one gigavolt. And so there are different measures of the Holy Spirit that is upon our lives that, uh, that we need to increase. So one of the things and requirements of our Lord Jesus Christ was that uh, we receive greater measure in order to be energized in miracles. However, however, it is not just a measure. Because even our Lord Jesus Christ, when He continued to be walking in the full measure in His own hometown in Mark chapter 8, uh, Mark chapter, uh, in the Gospel of Mark, we are told that He Himself in, could not do uh, many miracles because they did not believe in him. So the hearing of faith was still necessary in Mark chapter 6, rather. In Mark chapter 6, uh, it says, Then he went out from there, and uh, it says there, Then he went out from there and, uh, and came to his own country, and his disciples followed him, and when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach and many heard him. And then they did not believe he was Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. They could only see him as a carpenter. So without the hearing of faith, the miracle, the measureless anointing did not work for them. In verse 5, he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. So there you go. That even our Lord Jesus Christ, who got measureless anointing, it did not work unless the hearing of faith came. So the hearing of faith is still necessary, as Paul mentioned in Galatians chapter 3, verse, uh, verse 5. But we also need the other portion called the energizing, the supply of the Spirit. And Paul speaks about it doctrinally. Can you see he spoke about the supply of the Spirit as if it was a reality? The same in Philippians chapter 4, he talks about the supply of the Spirit as a reality, which means he believed in the concept of the quantity of the Holy Spirit uh, that is uh, working uh, in his life. And uh, 
here we look at uh, Galatians in chapter 4. He talk about uh, all that God is doing. And uh, let's uh, look at uh, this verse here where he talk about the supply that God has for him. Okay, let's start the uh, supply. It's the same Greek word as the word uh, supply, and um, in the book of uh, in the book of uh, Galatians chapter three uh, verse five. So let's jump straight to it in chapter four, and um, ah here it is um, chapter one verse nineteen. Yes, we have that. He says. For I know that all this in his persecution, he says, I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. So there we go. We realize that there are quantities of the energizing of the Spirit. And as we allow the Holy Spirit to energize us for we are the very instruments of God uh, as our body adapt to more and more of the quantity of the energizing. Now, you might ask God, why didn't God just bang, supply all the quantity? You and I might be the last day on earth if we are body, the body is not really that might be your last day on earth. God supply, yeah, here you go, zam! Next moment you're in heaven because your body died. Couldn't take that's one energizing. So remember, how much electrical content or energy a battery can contain is based on the actual structure of the battery. If it's a 12 volt battery, you can charge it to 12 volt and no more. If it's a 6 volt battery, you can charge it to 6 volt and no more. Even though you're connected to the main supply of your house, which is limitless. Uh, I mean, as much as you can draw, you draw out. And if it were 9 volts, it's 9 volts. If it's 100 volts, you might recharge it, whatever, if there's uh, such a thing. And uh, it depends on the battery capacity. It doesn't have to do with the limitation from God. God is unlimited. But our own internal plumbing and our internal structure limits the supply of the Holy Spirit within us. Structural changes within us can affect how much energizing we can receive from the quantity of the Holy Spirit. And that is why the quantity of the Holy Spirit in our life has to be increased with time. That God might increase you from 10 volts to uh, 20 volts, then you get used to it. Your, your spirit, soul, and body get used to it. Then from 20 volts to 40 volts and on and on. And it takes time. Uh, to increase. So we lay down the doctrine that there's such a thing as measures of the Holy Spirit. And the measure is increasing every year. Yes, the day will come when we will be able to transport ourselves uh, physically. As our bodies are used to the energizing of God, and then we live above the laws of the elements of the laws of physics of the earth. Then we can transport ourselves and we can move from place to place. And by that stage, you know, we will be over many, many natural forces also, besides the healing signs and wonders and miracles, restoring of youth, removal of blemishes, wrinkles in your life, and, and all the energizing that's upon your spirit, soul, and body. And we receive it measure upon measure. This is the understanding we need of the resurrection power of the Holy Spirit and of Lord Jesus Christ. Remember also this, that our Lord Jesus Christ walked with God for 30 years, before the full measure of the Holy Spirit came upon him. And uh, the Apostle Paul himself was not sent out into the ministry uh, straight away, even though he had calling to the ministry, until uh, the book of Acts chapter 13, verse 1. Although in Acts 11, he started ministering in the church for a year, yet it was not time for him until God sent him out, and then more of the greater supply of the Holy Spirit came upon his life. So there is such a thing as the supply of the Spirit of God together with the hearing of faith to create the miracles. Which is why in a miracle service, one of the important things is to sense the level of anointing working. So according to the level of anointing working, you can do different things. 
in fact, if the anointing is 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 working very powerfully, now the anointing level is not based upon people falling under power alone. John G. Lake's writings and teachings would teach you that uh, uh, it's not based on falling under the power because in his book he talked about young men whom he was training, and then uh, he he let the young young man pray. And then the young man was excited because almost everyone he prayed for under the power. And then he was excited. And then John G. Lake asked him, you know, look at him very fiercely and said, Well, how many of them were healed? And he looked, you know, there's none. And he said, Because you used all your energy to knock them uh, uh, under the power, you didn't use it for healing. Well, he got scolding instead of a blessing. And people like to see people fall so that today you got, you know, ministers pushing people and all those things. But the main thing, you see, people who purposely push people are just trying to demonstrate the Holy Spirit is there through a showmanship. But the best thing is to have actual healing. If all the energizing is to release into creating a creative miracle or to bring an impossible healing, that is the greatest power and blessing. And that is necessary. There is a supply the doctrine of the supply of the quantity of the Holy Spirit in every place, in every meeting. And sometimes it can be your default mode. That means if you're by default, you're used to 10 volts, that's yours permanently. You could be used to 100 volts or 1 mega volt. It, your life can reach a certain level where your comfort level is at a quantity. Remember, nothing to do with quality. Quality is always the same with God Almighty. But the quantity of the Spirit is required. That is the reason why sometimes you could be uh, in a meeting and there's a person who is uh, blind or what and they are not here in a meeting because for them it takes a higher quantity of the energizing to create a miracle. Now remember, sometimes the quantity is there but people still don't have faith, it still doesn't work. Just like in Jesus' life. You need those two forces to work together in the Holy Spirit, in the things of God. And uh, so when we have uh, understood this quantity of the Holy Spirit, your next question is, how do I increase the quantity in my life? What is the vehicle that can store the structure of battery power for the Holy Spirit to be stored? You already know the answer, but we might as well give it to you. There is only one structure that can contain the Holy Spirit, the Word of God. But it has to be the Word make flesh. Because what we want is for the Holy Spirit to come on the flesh. Because the flesh is the physical reality. Remember, we live in three realities. The reality of the Spirit, the reality of the soul, and the reality of the physical body. The things that are happening in the physical world are in the reality of the physical body. So we need the Word to actually become flesh in our physical body. In the book of uh, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12, it tells us here, for the word of God is life, zoe, and powerful, energizing, and against, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The word of God, this is the Logos of God, by the way, needs to work inside us, until it gets assimilated in our spirit, our soul, and our body. The law is very obvious. Why was it that Jesus Christ can uh, receive the Holy Spirit without measure? Because in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 14, the Bible says, He was the Word, became flesh, dwell among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus was 100% Word. His emotions were based on the Word. 
His thoughts were based on the word. His spoken word was based on the word. His mannerism and his acts was based on the word. Do you know there was nothing that Jesus did that he lived, he breathed, he worked, he spoke, he thought, everything was the living word. That is why he can have the spirit without measure. So the principle is, number one, there is a concept called the quantity of the spirit. Number two, the quantity of the spirit upon our flesh depends on the quantity of the word made flesh in us. So if you want a higher quantity of the Holy Spirit to be your default mode, you must become, have the quantity of the word make flesh in you. I emphasize the word make flesh, not just the word. Some people only know the word in their heads. They think that they know the Bible from Genesis to Revelation uh, is good enough, theoretically. No. The word must actually be within you. Until every thought and every intent of your heart is stirred up by the word of God in you. It's like the living word inside you. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people, they know the word in their heart. Look at all this pressure and crisis and all that. By the way, the word um, uh, persecution means pressure and tribulation. People who we think know the word, don't act like they know the word. What happened to all the teaching about Christian love? First love. What happened to all the doctrines? They only know it in the head. But under tribulation and persecution, they are not standing. They don't believe in the written word or the spoken word. They don't practice the written word and the spoken word. And, uh, and you get surprised. Hey, how come these people should know the word but they don't know the word? Because they only know the word in their heart, uh, in their head but it's not really in their heart and in a sense the word is there but the word is not make flesh if the word is make flesh when you put a person under pressure the word comes out because it is what your dna is made from uh, the word of god and so that's why i emphasize it is not just the word but the word make flesh and that takes a process Say, when does the word make flesh? The four different types of ground. Remember, I draw the first diagram of four different ground. The first is when the word comes, it's just outside. Whether you accept it or not, that's the first test. It's the one that drops on the pavement. So those who don't accept the word, it doesn't become flesh. They are hearers but not doers. Remember the story of the wise man versus the foolish man, what was different? One was a doer, one was only a hearer. Now, the doer was also a hearer and doer. But the foolish man was the one who hear but do not do. So they don't accept it into the heart. Then the second type of ground is where roots are formed. Pressure come. And they say some rejoice for a little while, but their roots are very short. Maybe like a little tauge. And then uh, you know, get crushed. But you need deep roots like a tree that go right deep. And it takes time because these are all Time. How long does it take to grow a big tree? Definitely longer than a tauge. Mm -hmm. A tauge, by the way, for those of you online who are not familiar, is uh, be, uh, bean sprouts. Bean sprouts, which is a delicacy in a Chinese uh, diet. Uh, bean sprouts, or you know, you might alfalfa sprouts or shoots, whatever. It might take a few weeks to grow a sprout root, correct? This sprout root is not going to stand against persecution. And uh, it is important to grow the roots of a tree. That takes time because it grows into your DNA. And then it needs hardship to grow. And the hardship, you still grow and grow. You don't care, which is why I say, I don't care what's going on all around me. I will keep loving Jesus with first love, meditating on the word, growing the word, like Psalm chapter 1. You know what happens you do in a persecution? Psalm chapter 1. You meditate on the word day and night. You don't care what's going around. In your season, in the time of season, you will bear fruit in its season whose leaves shall not wither because you make sure you're planted by the rivers of water. Meditate on the word. And so, we just keep growing the roots. And then number three, you start growing the shoots. 
And shoots are where the distractions of this life come. They take your energy and distract you. You refuse. You, no matter where God prosper you and the cares of this life come, you keep time for the word. And you grow the shoots and you grow the shoots and you grow the shoots. And then the word is flesh. You're ready for number four. Yes. You bear fruit 34, 64 or 104 according to how much the word is made flesh in you. See, there are these four processes for the word becoming flesh. In Colossians 3, verse 16, it says, Let the word of Christ dwell richly in you. Abundantly, because you need abundance and you don't know how much of the abundance take roots. And how your thinking is changed. One of the things I always look for for a spiritual person is two things. Their words and their thoughts. Didn't the gospel of James, uh, didn't the episode of James say in James chapter 3? You can tell whether someone is spiritual by their words. And if there's abundance of words and loose lips, no matter how the person tell you they 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 they're trying to show that they're very spiritual people, but they talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and don't know how to control their tongue. They're not spiritual people. Spiritual person is always careful of what they say. And the other thing is, I look for what a person is thinking or feeling. Because if a person is, does not have the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, then they must be in the flesh. And also, they are taught like. Remember, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, every thought must be subject to Christ. So when I, I listen to a person talk, because out of their words came from, come from their heart, out of their heart comes the thoughts. What a person is thinking about? Are they thinking about money, 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 money? Are they thinking about uh, uh, ego, 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 and I, 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 and pride all the time? It will come out. What is the gist of a person's conversation? Their thoughts will reveal whether the word is made flesh in them. Because when your thoughts become in line with the word of God, and uh, your emotions are in line with the word of God, then more of the word is made flesh. It's to be made flesh through your spirit, then through your soul, then through your body. And... So we answer the question, how do we have, there is such a concept as the quantity of the Holy Spirit. To have the quantity of the Holy Spirit, we need the quantity of the Word make flesh in us. And uh, so that is the battery, that is the infrastructure. And as the Word is make flesh, you can move from uh, uh, 10 volts to 100 volts to a megavolt to a gigavolt to a terawolt. Uh, and it began to increase upon your life to the millions of voltage that you can handle of the power of God. And I urge you, today God is looking for people to fulfill John chapter 14, verse 12, where he who believes in him will do the works that he did and greater works than this shall he do. And so we need to increase in Christ in us, increase in you in Christ, until you and Christ are so in oneness that everything you do, speak, say, and breathe comes of Jesus Christ in you, then you're in a position to receive the quantity of the Holy Spirit. God has to trust you and God will prove and test. You know why? It is a big investment of God. Because when God gives you such power and authority, you must already have passed the test that you will not use it to turn stones into bread for your own satisfaction. He will not use you to use it in a wrong way. You will only use the power of God according to His instructions, recognizing that without Jesus, you and I can do nothing. So that is why the testing is so severe, the proving is so severe, until man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of, the life, uh, out of the mouth of God. You literally live based on the word. You literally only exist based on the word. And as long as the word endures forever, you will endure forever. And that is why every test is to prove whether the word is in your life. And whether the word is has been saturated and become flesh in your life. And that takes time and patience for that to, to work. Of course, God can accelerate it. Which comes to point number three. We look at the acceleration process here in the Old Testament, in the book of Second Kings, in the encounter between Elijah and Elisha. In Second Kings chapter 2. Remember, he wanted a quantity of the Holy Spirit. And so, 
he was uh, exercising these basic attributes that were there. And um, in X, uh, no, in Second Kings chapter two, in verse one, it came to pass when the Lord was about to take up Elijah into heaven by a wind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Then Elijah said to Elisha, "Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to battle." Elisha says, "As the Lord lives, as your soul lives, I will not leave you." So they went down to battle. Now the sons of the prophets who were at battle came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? He says, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Then in verse 4, Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here please. Now by that time he has already served him for nearly about 10 years, according to scholars. For the Lord has sent me on to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. Verse 5. The sons of the prophets who were at Jericho came to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? Of course he knows. So he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Verse 6. Elijah said to him, Stay here, please. For the Lord has sent me on to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on, and fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood facing them at a distance where the two stood by the Jordan. Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up, struck the water. It was divided this way and that. So the two of them crossed over on dry ground. So it was when they crossed the Jordan. Remember, this is the fourth place. First at Gilgal, then to battle, then Jericho, uh, to Jericho. Uh, let's see the order. Uh, uh, to battle. And then the Jericho, then the Jordan, four places. And finally, after they crossed the fourth place, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask, what may I do for you before I am taken from you? The word ask is the Hebrew word sa'al, sometimes pronounced sha'el as a primitive root, which means to inquire. To request, to demand, to lay charge of, uh, to earnestly inquire. And uh, in the authorized version, it has been translated 94 times as ask, 22 times as inquire, 9 times as desire, 7 times as require, 6 times as to borrow, 4 times as salute, 4 times to demand, 4 times as lend three times as request, two times earnestly, two times back, and miscellaneous usage, 16 times, which means it is a desire inside them. That is why Jesus said, whatsoever things you desire. A person can never grow higher and deeper than what they desire. Which is why we always ask people, what do you desire? Do you know what my main ambition in life is? I want to be the man who walks closest with Jesus and to be exactly like Jesus. I was given, I told the story many times in, the, in my life, that there was one time when I was asked, what do you want? I didn't ask for riches. I didn't ask for fame. I said, I want to be exactly like Jesus Christ on the planet Earth. That's my one desire. I want to be the person who walks closest with God on planet Earth. And it's very strange. With so much love for Jesus, I sometimes laugh and amaze and can only make you smile. Why do people want to think that you could be a false prophet, false this, when you love Jesus so much? You know, it's the very opposite. Satan must be very frightened of people who love Jesus so much. And uh, so that's my actual aim. In fact, you know, if there are no churches, no ministries, and I'm all alone by myself just growing in God, that's still my aim. Which is why I say my first calling is a worshipper of God and not to any ministry. That's always been my goal. That's always been my desire. And what do you desire in your life? That's important. Some people desire silver and gold. Some people desire power. And 
Elisha desired double portion of Elijah's anointing. What do you desire? So Elijah asked Elisha, Ask, what do you desire? A man, a woman, a child can never rise higher than the hope and desire in their hearts. So let God purify your heart and desire so that you desire one thing and one thing alone, Christ Jesus. And to help people, of course, my our second desire is to help people to become like Jesus, to walk as closely with Jesus as possible. And uh, so if people want to benefit from uh, the benefits of walking close with Jesus, I will teach you all the principles I can. Which is why sometimes uh, 40 years of ministry and principle walking with Jesus can be compressed into one year with proper teaching and you can help a person accelerate faster. Uh, now, so it's important, ask, seek God what you desire. And uh, Pastor Leo is here. I showed him my file from 1979 when I desired to walk with God, but he not walk with God. And I desire in 1979, I wrote down all the mysteries of God in the New Testament and said, God, I'd like to understand all of them. 1979, in written form. So one need to encapsulate the desire in God. And I even mentioned early in my ministry in the 90s, uh, I said, I already got a list of what I want to achieve on the planet Earth. Once I finish, I'm ready to go home. So that by the time in August of 2012, when the Archangel Raphael asked under the ministry of the first seven thunders in Madaba, what do you want? I sort of summarizes uh, four main things for my 17 points. And uh, then if you look at the video, I mean, there is a video record of that. As he was about to bless, because everyone was given uh, one blessing. And then as he was about to bless, and it was a mental prayer between me and the Lord. And, and I was talking to the Lord. Out of the 17, let me uh, uh, ask for these four. And then he didn't hear me, but it was communication in the street. And then you can see him turn around and say, can he ask for that? So uh, you know, on the spot, I was asking more than one thing. And then, of course, uh, the Lord says, can. And that was the four things I asked from the Lord. What do you desire? Because that will be your driving force. And if your desire is encapsulated and, and you know what you want out of life, no matter persecution, tribulation, hardship or anything, you will still keep going on that line. For without a vision, the people perish. Without a focus in your personal life, you will turn to the left and to the right instead of walking straight before God. One is to know what one desires in God. Ask, he says. And besides that, Persistence. Persistent. Now, remember the third point I'm talking about, how to accelerate the process. And there are four points. One is the greater desire that you have for the right thing. Some people desire the wrong thing. Like James, he warned us, don't desire for the wrong things. When you desire for the right things, it is good. And so that will accelerate the process because you know what you want. Let, let, let's look at Elisha. After 10 years of serving Elijah, he knows what he wants, correct? Because by the time you say, ask what you want, you better know what you want. He, he already knew what he want. And he was tested four times. He was asked to stay back at Gilgal, at Battle, at Jericho, at the Jordan. And he says, I'm not staying back. So that desire will fire number two, Persistence. Persistent. Which is why like I say, church or no church, ministry or no ministry, whether I have a million members or zero members, makes no difference to my desire and my goal to walk closely with Jesus more than any human being on the planet. Does not change that. Now, if you've got a lot of people supporting you, helping, encouraging, and wanting to be the same, God bless you. Wonderful. But with or without that, my desires and goal in God are clear cut what I want out of this life. What do you want out of your life? Which is number two, when your, when your desire is uh, formulated, articulated and written down, then you are very persistent. You will keep going forward. You will keep going forward. You keep going forward. You keep going forward because whether there are giants in the land, you still go forward. 
whether the hardship and difficulty, because sometimes God allows hardship and difficulty to test what is in your heart. Remember, to test what is in your heart. He told them in the book of Deuteronomy, I brought you to the wilderness to test what is in your heart. So your heart must have it. And uh, if they were having thirsty, not enough water to drink, and then hungry at times, and then God provided manna, God provided all those things. But they did go through a tough time in the wilderness, and Joshua and Caleb survived. The second generation survived because they had God in their side. They want God. In the end, persistence must be there. The people who are not persistent. And of all things, Jesus told the parable of the woman and the unjust judge. Why did he tell it? He talked about the end time, actually. If you look at the context, he talks about the end time. He tells us that when the Son of Man come back, will he find faith? So part of the demonstration of faith is persistence. Now, let's look at the Apostle Paul's life. Was he persistent? Yes. Once he pursued Jesus, there were a thousand and one things that stopped him. Remember, the day he was born again, he wanted to preach, they tried to kill him. Then he went to Arabia uh, and then came back to Damascus, tried to preach. They still tried to kill him. They let him down in a basket in Acts chapter 9, verse 25. Acts chapter 9, verse 26, he met with the apostles for 15 days or so, according to Galatians. And... Uh, with especially Peter and then James. He didn't meet with the others. And it tells us that uh, he's persistent. He still wanted to preach. But then they tried to kill him. And then he ended up in his hometown. And uh, then uh, while waiting in his hometown, he still wanted to know God. He still wanted to preach. Nothing stopped him. Not whether he was full-time or not full-time. Not whether he got money or no money. Not whether he was recognized or not recognized. He was unknown by faith. He was not recognized at that time. And yet he persisted in wanting to know Christ and Christ crucified. Remember what Paul said about his persistence in uh, Philippians chapter uh, 2 and then chapter 3? He says, all his education and everything he had, he count as dung for the pursuit of Jesus Christ and him alone. How much is Jesus valued in his life? You look at the persecution that he listed in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, just 1% or 10% or 20% or 30% or 50% of that would have stopped any ordinary man from stop, uh, calling and, and, and following Jesus. Paul never stopped. He never stopped his ministry, never stopped following Jesus because he knew what he wanted. He was persistent because of his desire for God. And that's how you can accelerate and increase the process. I believe I accelerated increase it in my life when I wrote it down. And then I pray every day for 30, 40 years for those things that I wanted from God. And it helps in the acceleration process. Then look at uh, 2 Kings chapter uh, 2, verse 10. Elijah says, You have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I'm taken from you, it shall not, it shall be so for you. If not, it shall not be so. Now, number three is very important. For Elisha, the condition was set. It, after 10 years of desire, after four places of testing in Gilgal, in battle, in Jericho, in Jordan, it all boiled down to this one thing he must do. If he fail in this final thing, everything will have been wasted. Sometimes when you flow with God, there is one act, one thing that God asks of you. Which is why many people fail the test in this end time move. Because at the end of the day, like let's say the 4 plus and the 12 plus and some of the, the 30 or the 70 or the 120, do you know there's only one thing God asks? Stand by the voice that cried at midnight. That's all you need to do to receive your portion. But as you can tell, it's not easy to stand. Because when you stand, you are isolated and attacked. And all you had to do was say, Hey, 
I have been with this guy for a time. He's only talking Bible, talking about first love, talking about Jesus, you know. And then you ask yourself this question. Where else can you find the spiritual food for the end time? You can go back to traditional Christianity and people will tell you, don't go here, don't go here, don't go here. But what do they offer you? What do they offer you? They can only frighten the sheep. But what do they offer? Traditional Christianity. That's it. Do you know, up to now, we have had much persecution since this move started in 2012, correct? Tell me, in 2012 to 2017 now, what has all those who have opposed from long years ago offered? Is there another revelation, even those who have left, who can claim CC vision? Is there another direction? Is there another vision to way go forward? Are there understandings of how to move deeper into God? None. The restaurants are empty. Although, we will be first to tell you, we are not the only one with the end time message. But, Everyone has tidbits here and there. You cannot live your life on tidbits. You need proper nutrition spiritually in order to grow into the glorious church. Amen. And this is what we offer you. Doctrines to teach you and renew your mind how to become the glorious church. Practices and methodology that pray fast. We not only tell you to fast and pray, we fast and pray along. Protected prayer, seeking God. Thirdly, worship and emphasize to always check our motives to love Jesus first. Always go back to reading of the Bible and of all the teachings on the planet Earth, one of our most foundational teachings is meditation on God's Word. Some of you have made use of meditation food one and two. It has blessed millions of people. And we got more meditations to give to people as we progress. Some people I say, hey, Pastor, I got meditation book one and two, got more. I say, People really cannot handle a lot of it. Wait till more people are hungry, then we'll release more meditation. There's meditations in all the various areas. But people need to understand. It's back to the Bible. Back to not just Bible knowledge. Back to eating the Bible like the Word of God. A man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And that is why Elijah says, there is one more condition. Because what you ask is a hard thing. It is a hard thing. Otherwise, every Tom, Dick, and Harry will right now be operating John 14 verse 12. For 2,000 years, put it this way, for 2,000 years, with all the doctrines that we have in Christianity, we thank God for our uh, predecessors who have brought forth all the doctrines of God, men and women of faith on whom we stand on their shoulders. That's why we could reach further. If all the doctrines of 2,000 years of Christianity is brought forward and you literally absorb them, is it enough for this end time? I can tell you it's not enough. Because 2,000 years of Christianity cannot produce John 14 verse 12 in fullness. Something must change, correct? Any reasonable person will tell you, if you keep doing what you're doing as usual, you will only produce the usual result. You must enter into something and change certain things in order to have a different results. Renew the heart, renew the mind, to press further to have a different result, which is why there is a test. Sometimes the test is, you must go to a certain place, you must uh, uh, be in this altar building, you must be there. Only God can design it for you, individualize it for you. And it's not for me to tell individuals what to do. I always, the time people ask me, should I be here, should I be there? You know what my answer is? Ask the Lord and pray. I will just be just there to confirm, but I cannot tell you what to do. 
It's my policy. I never tell people what to do. I ask people, seek the Lord, ask the Lord what you want, He wants you to do. And I can guarantee you, this is a year increase. You stick to this message, you will increase, you will double, you will triple, because this is the sixth year of the end time move. We are coming to the completion of the first seven years by 2020. Three more years to go. And as we finish the first seven year cycle, move into the second year cycle, you begin to see more and more the things of God. And uh, it is important that you ask the third question here. What does God ask you to do to receive your double portion, your triple portion, or the portion that you have asked and desired in your life? I can assure you, God being God, it will come down to some basic, simple to-do list. And you need to know what the to-do list is in your own life. It might be different from somebody else. Not everybody's to-do list is the same. God, like Elijah giving to Elisha, at the end of the day, this is the one thing you must pass. This is the one test you must pass. If you don't see me when I go, all your 10 years of desire, all your passing Gilgal, Bethel, and Jericho, and Jordan is wasted if you did not pull out your bootstrap at the last minute. You remember Olympic race and Olympic events? Sometimes the person can win through all the preliminary and even, you know, as they run the race, whether it be a 400 meter race or 800 meter race, that you can win the first 400 meter in the 800. But then the last 100 meter, you lapse, you're gone and the medal goes to somebody else. It's the last bit. And remember, the last bit of the race is important. That's why Paul says in the book of Hebrews chapter 12, he says, run the race, look to Jesus. Run the race with joy. Lay down every weight beside you. If anything, you must let go, let go, so that you can run and finish the race. Because once you finish the race, you can take everything back. That God bless you above, beyond all that you're able to. God asks you to seek first the kingdom of God. And then he says, he adds all these things to you. So you give up a lot to seek first the kingdom. Then when you seek the kingdom, he adds all these things back to you. He's running the race. You must be a soldier. You must be a runner. And you must finish a race with gusto. With all intention, purposes, I intend together with, you know, many in this move, intend to run this race with gusto. We finish a race with all that is within us. Whatever conditions God lay on us, fulfill your personal condition. That is point three. Whatever is that. For Elisha, he must not let his eyes be taken off. Again, it comes to the eye gate we talked about last week. Your eyes must be on the vision. They want you to look at different things, left, right, center, all those things. The enemy try to make you look at false vision, false words, false audit, but they got nothing to offer. They can only tell you what not to, not, not to move, be in this move, but they got nothing to offer. Zero, zero, nothing to offer. But for us, you're saying, keep your eyes on what God has spoken through the first seven thunder, second seven thunder, even the second seven thunder does not believe his own visions anymore. The words of God are still true, yea, and amen. And the same with all the spoken word. We must be faithful to the spoken word as much as to the written word. And all I ask people is this. Okay, the enemy got false visions and all those things. And the enemy keep calling individuals up. You see, that's the way the enemy moves. He don't dare to confront doctrine to doctrine, face to face. He isolates. And then they claim false vision, they claim to have their own dreams and all those things. Some of these same very people, because I know some of them, I know some of their own dreams and visions, some of them are actually from their soul. Before, that's why I have never propagated, have, have I ever used any of their vision? Because I know when they share with me, I say, okay, this part is their personal and their soul. And when some of these very people say their vision and all these things, here's the thing. What about your own visions and revelation? You have none. You have walked with the Lord. If many of these people believe their own genuine original visions from the Lord, they will still be going on strong. Which means that the devil succeeded in the first and the second seed. He makes them doubt their own vision, what they saw from the Lord. And 
if they believe what God originally speaks. And here's the thing, you go back to traditional Christianity. In the end, you pray fast, seek the Lord, you still have to come up with visions and revelations that tell you in this modern earth, modern world, what to do with your life. Because the Bible is not going to tell you where to live. The Bible is not going to tell you in your individual life exactly what you're going to do in your life. You still need direction. You still need to be led by the Spirit for those who are led by the Spirit are the sons of God. You still need Acts chapter 2 that the Spirit pour out and uh, young men shall see vision, old men shall dream dream. You still need visions and revelations. So if you did not learn the art of seeing visions and revelations interpreting them, you still need to learn them and learn to discern them. And you have your own revelation, your own rima or rhema from the Lord. Do not doubt what the Lord has spoken because they will be the conditions that God set on your life. Sometimes no conditions are given but it's implied. Like Jeroboam was told when God gave him 10 tribes and he says, I will build you a dynasty. The first thing he did go idol worship and play the political game because he didn't want people to go to the southern kingdom. Wrong. Straight away he lost all his blessings. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep focus on first love for Jesus. Keep focus on walking with God. See, we teach a message on first love not too long ago. How many people keep that message? First love for Jesus. Vision on Jesus. And when you keep what you hear on the word, then you can pass test number three to accelerate it. You will know what God wants you to do. For me, I know that God asked me to do the work of the ministry. Do you know the price I pay to remain in ministry? It cost me everything. To remain in the ministry cost me everything. And I choose to follow the call of God. What does it cost you to follow God? Take up the cross and follow Him and be a disciple of Jesus. For a vision that is not worth dying for is not worth living for. And the true visions of God that come from Jesus will cost us everything to follow. Correct? It's in the Bible. Take up the cross and follow. Remember the rich young man? He cannot follow Jesus because it was inconvenient. There's a cost. Jesus gave him a chance to follow. He did not follow. And he went sadly away because the price was too great for his natural man. It cost me everything to continue in the ministry. What does it cost you to follow Jesus? Think about that. Gone is the God of idolatry and a false God. Gone is a false God of money and fame and pleasure. Gone is the false gods of convenience. To follow Jesus, we must take up the cross, die to self, follow him. Then we will see the end result. And that is what it will cost Elisha. So from that day onward, he never let his eyes be taken away from Elisha. And we can summarize the third test is, hold fast to what God spoke to you. My sheep hear my voice. What did God speak to you? Don't follow another you know, I never ask people to follow even my own vision. I always say, you pray. Check with your own heart. Don't follow the enemy's deceptions and lies. What does your heart tell you? What is the vision of your heart? In the end, there will be a judgment day. I tell you, these people have no fear of God. Neither on this earth, which they should actually be right now trembling and fearing the Lord as this message goes out. Because the Lord Jesus said He's going to use individuals who become like Pharaoh as targets 
to show his glory because they have chosen to be like Pharaoh and his minion. And these people have no fear of God. Do you know you must stand at the judgment seat and give account for what you say and do, every idle word in your life? What will these people say at the judgment seat? And I am someone who profess Jesus is Lord. I love Jesus with all my heart, my soul, and strength. I'm only in the ministry because I want to be like Jesus. I want to teach people to be like Jesus. Now, what will they do when they stand in the judgment seat and face Jesus? I tell you, the fear of God should be upon your life. So God speaks to our heart. In the end, you and I will have to answer for our own life. You cannot say, I did this because somebody told me. Or your husband and wife, father, mother, brother or sister told you. Even though they might be influenced in your life. Whatever you do, whatever decision you make, has to be before the throne of God. And you're answerable and accountable to God for the decisions you make. You cannot blame another person. You cannot turn around and say, oh, you're not following you know, Pastor Johan because of this, 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 that. You have your own decision. You cannot blame it on somebody else. You cannot blame it on something stumbling you. You cannot blame it on anyone except the person in the mirror whom you see. You are accountable at the judgment seat for your own decision, your own life. Because everyone has enough revelation to go by. The last point in point number four. Verse 12, it was fulfilled. Elisha saw it. He cried out, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and his horsemen. And then look at the struggle. After he received the double portion, he has to learn how to flow with the double portion. You can see in verse 14, as he looked at the Jordan River going back, he still was not sure how to operate. So he asked, where is the Lord God of Elijah? So he was still working it. Then when he confronted the sons of the prophets, the sons of the prophets say, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. They came to me. Now don't forget, Elisha was known as the servant of Elijah. In chapter 3, the king says, isn't this Elisha who used to pour water for Elijah? So he's still the one who poured water poured, uh, and was a servant. Now, it is not easy to accept the servant of Elijah now as the head of the group of prophets. So that is why they were, they were the sons of the prophets in verse 16. They come, they bow before him. Then verse 16, they say, look now. There are 50 strong men with your servant. That means there's a whole few hundred one of them. And they said, let us go and, and, and search for your master. And he know the master already go. And then look at, verse, uh, at the end of verse 16. You shall not send it. He was now the head. He was now in authority. He said, no, don't go. They never listened to him. And look at verse 17. They urged him until he was ashamed. That means he was still learning to operate the authority and power and learning to get people under the chain of command. So he became so ashamed, you know, people like maybe some of them blaming him. Hey, why don't you, no, 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 what, what happened to him? Well, come on, la, this is Elijah. He got transported him, God could transport him back anywhere. Common sense also tell them, Elijah will never stop. The same God who transported him anywhere can feed him. After all, the ravens fed him, the widow fed him, and not everything. God can take care of him. If God took him away, God can bring him back, if really that is the case. So what they say is a silly thing. What they say was a natural thing, and they were thinking in a natural. Why, 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 wasn't it many times the sons of the prophet came? Do you know that the Lord is taking your master from you today? Come on! They were not even listening to their own prophecy and their own words. They urged him until he was ashamed. Then you know they went and searched for him for three days. Wasted three days. And when they came back for three days, then they couldn't find him. 
They, he I said, didn't I tell you not to go? So what was number four? He was learning how to operate power and authority. And that is a different level. Because one of the last people that will accept that you are not who you are in the natural, but you're who you are in the spiritual, is your own loved ones. After all, didn't his hometown, in Jesus', uh, Jesus hometown, refuse to accept him as a Messiah? Why? Because they were too naturalized. They were thinking in the natural. And when your thinking lowers down to the natural, you cannot accept the things of God. If Jesus were right now manifested, people in the natural will still reject him. Because they will find a natural reason to reject him. And they found a natural reason. Isn't, isn't he the carpenter? Isn't he Joseph's son? Aren't his sisters with us? Aren't his brothers with us? All natural reasons to reject Jesus. But now at the judgment seat, all of them are without excuse. Which is why number four is important, which is another lesson we'll teach further. How to operate in each new level of authority and power. Which is why people don't understand sometimes why sometimes I proclaim certain things. Like the Apostle Paul. Paul would say, I am an apostle uh, called by God and not of man. Why do you think Paul wrote that? Not because he was trying to be proud. Not because you know he was uh, doing anything. Because he needed to proclaim who he is in God. Remember, the devil will always challenge who you are. Which is why when the devil challenges who I am, I will keep proclaiming who I am in the Lord. It is for the sake of the spiritual atmosphere and to show that you still believe and accept who God called you to be. Whatever position you have that God has given, and all positions come from God, and everything that God, if God has raised you up to different energizing level, different level of position, you must proclaim. If you are one of the four living creatures, you must proclaim. I am one of the four living creatures. And I take this stand. I am one of these twelve who stand. There are people who are no more in and they try to proclaim who they are. You need to proclaim who you are. Just as the false deceivers, the false brethren, and people who oppose, try to proclaim who they are. They try to claim vision and all this. You need to stand and proclaim, I am one of the two plus, three plus, one of the four plus, one of the twelve. And I proclaim that I know who I am. I stand by this end time word, what God has. You need to proclaim. You are one of the glorious church, one of the thirties, one of the seventies, one of the hundred and twenties. You need to stand and say, I am one of the mighty men and women of God who stands by the tabernacle of David in this last move. I am one of the seventies, one of the hundred and twenties. I proclaim and then the devil will not disturb you anymore. Because the crux of all attacks of the devil from Genesis to Matthew 4 is who are you in Christ? When you know who you are, the enemy ceases. The whole target is who you are. And for every one of you, the minimum you are is you are part of the glorious church in this end time world who will rise to be in the days of the ten toes, the kingdom of God on the earth. You're a member of the kingdom of God. And I close with Isaiah chapter 60. And all these blessings are yours. And it tells us in Isaiah chapter 60. And uh, it tells us, uh, besides all the blessings of God, spirit, soul, and body, right towards the end, the last verse in verse 22. A little one shall be a thousand. Amen. A small one, a strong nation. Now tell me. How can it be? It cannot be fulfilled in Israel, correct? But let me tell you, the smallest member of the top 500 in this end time move is a nation. Yeah. If I ask you, literally, how can it be fulfilled? Israel is only one nation. But in the nation of our Lord Jesus Christ, of which we are all citizens of heaven, in the kingdom of God and in the empire of Christ in this end time move, where the decree of the ancient of days says that it is time for the saints to possess a kingdom 
And our land of Canaan is the planet Earth, where we will say two-thirds of the population of the planet Earth, and people of six billion souls in all the planet Earth, then the smallest one among us is a nation in itself. Hallelujah. And a little one, a thousand. That's who you are in Christ, in a glorious church. So rise up, all you top 500. Rise up! Take your position. And march forward for the enemy that look like giants. Joshua and Caleb say they are just food for us. And in this year, you will see the devil flee. The fallen angels flee. The enemy flee. And they will flee before you. Because James chapter 4, verse 7 and 8 says, Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Submit yourselves to God. Draw near to God. He will draw near to you. So, arise, take your stand, and as long as you know who you are, that's when the enemy starts running, and he will flee from you. Amen. Father, we thank you for your grace, your mercy that you establish. Ooh. Let your power be upon your people. Energize your people. Increase the quantity of the Spirit in each life. As they take their place, Show them your glory. Yes. Show them yes. your power. Yes. Like Moses, we raise the standard before you. We stand with Pharaoh's army behind us with the Red Sea in front and the mountains on one side. And we say, this is the day. Stand still and see the salvation of our God. Who shall this day cause Pharaoh's army to be destroyed for the horse and the rider shall all be overthrown and drowned in the Red Sea as they walk across the Red Sea into the Promised Land, into that which you have to build the Ark of the Covenant and to walk with the presence of God in our life. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.